Um, are you going over there? I'm sorry. What did you say? Okay. What's the question? My connection is unstable, but I said okay. Yeah, I will go over the exam. No, I okay. want to know if you're going to go over the uh, You are getting disconnected, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> yes, I will go over the exam. Okay. Now, uh, did you guys get a chance to see your grade? Okay, great. Yes. All right. Now I'm going to go over the exam and you can see it. Um, basically, most of these questions were in your book, so you could review it, but I will just go over that. Um, the first question was, what are the three basic elements that constitute any long transportation planning process? Okay, if you go to your page um, 191 of your textbook, you can pretty much uh, read that. And most of you correctly answered that question. The uh, answer to it is that the first one is forecasting demand for the system at the various levels of the facility provision being considered. That's the first one, forecasting demand. The second one is description of economic, social, and environmental changes that will occupy the development of the system at the same level of the facility. <coughs> and the third one will be the evaluation of the system in terms of benefits and this benefit occurring from the uh, various options considered. So those are the three items that you had to list. And that question had six points. Any question on that? As I said, you can go to your book on page 191 and see those three items. Any question on this question? All right. The second question was, functional classification involves grouping streets and highways into classes of system according to the character of the system that they are intending to provide. What are the classes and their purpose? So here we are looking at the classes and purpose. If you go back again to your chapter one, you will see that functional classification. Um, that is classified as <coughs> travel, <coughs> travel mobility and access. I've gone over that in the lecture, show you that basically I show you on a graph that this is the mobility, this is the access and the functional classification. We have a freeway here. And then we have a uh, freeway has 100% mobility, no access. And then you have arterial street, which could be major arterial or minor arterial. And it has major purpose is mobility, but it has some access. And then it has, we have collectors, which is a major collector, minor collector. So that is access and mobility, less access, more, mob uh, more access, uh, less mobility. And then we have a local streets which is the function is, or the purpose is just mainly access. So 
That is, a, that is the answer to the question number two. As I said, you can find it in chapter one. And uh, it is on the video and is, uh, this is the graph that I described for you in the class also. Any question on that? And that was six points. So the next question is, what three rivers from the most important section of the Indian waterways? Um, you can go to page 16 of your book and find these rivers, which is one is Mississippi River. The second one is Ohio River. And the third one is Tennessee River. Page 16 of your textbook. Any question on that? That was six points. Number four is what is the comprehensive transport study and what are the general procedure used? Again, you go to page 215 on chapter eight and you can look at that and it tell you that comprehensive transportation study is an examination of the supply and demand relationship of the transport over the planning horizon. And the procedures are first setting up an administrative organization. Second, we collect data, data collection. Third, we do analysis of the present and future status of the transportation. Fourth, development of a transportation plan and financial program. Five, implementation. Six, updating procedures. So this is listed on page 215, chapter eight. Any question on that? And that was the six points. Number five is in the system approach, what's the difference between problem recognition and problem definition? Objective and constraints. I went over that in the class several times. I said the difference between problem recognition and problem definition is problem recognition, you just see a problem, like suddenly you see a car slow down, and there's a congestion, okay? And uh, you just recognize there's a problem, that's it. You don't know anything about the problem. But on the problem definition, you need to investigate, you need to collect data to find out what is the problem, where's the problem come from, and what is the problem? So defining the problem. So that is the difference between them. The first one, you just see it, recognize it, that there's a problem. The second one, you need to investigate, collect data, especially, to find out what causes that problem. The difference between objective and constraint, okay? A lot of you write that objective is our goal. No, it's not our goal. Objective is the way we reach goal. It's not our goal. Because we have a goal and then below goal is objective. In order to reach our goal, we have to have objectives. Objectives are measurable, goals are not. But the objective is what we want to happen. For instance, we have a traffic congestion and our objective is to get rid of the congestion. That's our objective. The constraint basically are things that prevent us from certain alternative solutions. And we talk about that extensively. We have a physical constraint, for instance. If you don't have room available to extend the freeway, that's a physical constraint. If you don't have money to finance it, 
that's a constraint. And we talk about environmental constraint, we talk about political constraint. So those are constraints that prevent us from doing those options. All right, now, that was eight points, four points for each part. Number six, we are talking about highway user tax, okay? Um, so we are saying that, what are the principal sources, sources of highway user taxes? Okay, a lot of you made mistake that what's the principal sources of financing highway? That's not the question. Highway user tax. Highway user tax is one of the uh, item on financing highways. So what are the highway user taxes? So again, you can go to your book and find it pretty easy. The highway user taxes are fuel tax gasoline tax, for instance, registration taxes related to, uh, and, 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 and related taxes, and special taxes on commercial vehicles. So those are the highway user taxes. In case some of you answered that right, and some of you made a mistake and uh, uh, made mistake with the, financing highways. Okay, that was the three points. Number seven, why planning is important. And if you remember, I went over that in the class. I even asked that, I even told you that I put some time in the exam and we went over that again and so on. So some of those reasons are, first of all, it will take a long time to build any type of transportation facilities, such as highways, for instance. If you decide to build a highway from point A to point B, it might take 10 to 15 years until we complete that. So if we are building that highway for what we need today, by the time we build them 10 or 15 years from now, that highway is not going to be good. So for that reason, we need planning. We need to forecast what we need 25 to 40 years from now. So we build enough capacity to handle the future demand. Another reason, every time you want to build something, obviously you need money. So how are you going to get the money? You have to have a plan to show people that this is the plan, I need to build an eight lane highway and it's gonna cost this much money. So people should see what your plan is and why you, where you are spending the money. The third thing is that we need to find what would be the environmental impact of that project. For instance, what would be environmental impact as far as um, air pollution, noise pollution, water pollution, and so on, so that we can come up with solution for that. So the problem that causes, which all will be listed in the environmental impact report. So we need to have a plan because if we, know, if we don't have a plan, we don't know how much noise is gonna generate because two lane freeway is different than three lane and four lane and eight lane and so on. Another reason could be that all components of the transportation system has to be compatible with each other. So for instance, if you are building an airport, you have to make sure there's enough parking spaces in that airport that people can park and go to the gate. <coughs> or there's enough stairway capacity or enough elevated capacity you never, uh, you've got to have enough capacity at the uh, security uh, points and so on. So by just increasing the number of airplane landing and departing at the airport, it doesn't do you any good because all the components has to be compatible with each other. 
So that's another reason we need planning. And then another one that I mentioned is that every time you want to build some transportation facility, you got to invite citizen and listen to their feedback because citizens are important. So we have to have a citizen participation. So the citizens have got to know what you're going to do and why you are doing it for the future. So you got to have a plan. So those are five reasons that I mentioned it. And I ask you here for listing four of them. All right. So that was uh, eight points, two points for each. And number eight, um, what's the purpose of reliever airport? And most of you answered that right. Is it reliever airport is a general aviation airport in most of the uh, metropolitan area that are intended to reduce congestion at the large hub airport. So we are building some reliever airports, smaller airport around the big airport that we can reduce congestion from those large airports we call reliever airports. That was six points. And then number um, nine is what are the three commissions or board that regulate the railroad, <coughs> airline, trucking and bus companies and other commercial carriers. And a lot of you answered that one right too, if, except a few. One is the Surface Transportation Board, SDA, I mean STB. The second one is the Federal Marine Time Commission, FMC. Third one is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commerce Commission. That's the FERC. So those are the three um, commissions that pretty much regulate the transportation system. Number 10, I made a mistake. So it's the same as number one. So if you answer the number one right, you got that one right. Um, number 11, uh, I'm asking you what is the uh, purpose of the TSM? and uh, listing four of them. So the first one is reducing demand. So we wanna reduce demand on the roadways by measuring by number of uh, ways like carpooling, van pulling and so on. There are a list of them. Increasing the supply that means increasing the capacity of the network, such as adding another lane, doing good engineering at the, for the highways, okay, providing or marketing tra uh, transit and so on, reducing demand and de degrade supply. So we wanted this reducing the demand, which was the first one, and degrade supply. So carpool degrade the supply because when we are doing a carpool, we are allocating one of the lane, which is part of the supply into the uh, carpool. So we're reducing the supply and then we are reducing the demand that way because we have a carpool. Or increasing supply and reduce demand. Obviously, if you increase the supply, adding other lanes and so on and do a good engineering work and then reduce the demand that will affect the uh, overall uh, reduction in cost. So those are the TSM measures, four of them. It's listed on your chapter seven in the book. All you have to do is just know where it is and write it. And that was eight points. Number 12, uh, we are talking about what are the four elements of limited parking study. Um, again, you go to your chapter eight, and uh, you can see the limited parking study. And it says that is a parking supply, usage, per, uh, duration of a parking, 
and parking meter revenues. Those are the four that's listed in your book. And that's all you had to do and write those and it was eight points. Now, number 13 was cordon line and screen line. And I described those extensively in my lectures. The cordon line is simply imaginary line that you put around your study area. And I mentioned that if somebody comes to me and say, okay, I want you to study congestion downtown LA. The first question I'm gonna ask you is, what do you mean by downtown LA? Where are the boundaries? So from what street north and what street south and east and west that I have to study. So when they tell me that I put a line around the, that area, we call that cordon line. And screen line, so this will be a cordon line around study area and screen line are lines that are within your cordon line. And I mentioned that, that we use the screen line it again is the imaginary line to test the data and then find the problems along those lines to see. And I made an example in the class or in the meeting that if you have an orange that's spoiled inside, if you cut it, it slice, then you can see where that spoilage is. Or in medical terminology, we call it CAT scan or MRI, that they take a layer, pictures of the layer of your brain to see where the tumors are. So we do the same thing here and we call it a screen line. And number 14 was just a problem that is pretty much solved in your book with a different level of service. I just changed the data and gave you that. So we have a level of service D um, and then uh, it, it says that it's a level train. And uh, it says it's 11 foot lane, four feet shoulder. Okay. And uh, it has a 40% no passing and 70, 30% split. And then you have 15% truck, 2% RVs and 5% buses. So you know that the formula is given in that page in your book. So you will try to find the service flow at level of service D. So that is equal to 2,800 times V over C ratio, okay, times F sub D, times F sub W, times F sub HV. So you got to find each of these items and multiply by 2,800 and you get it. So where do we get the V over C ratio? Well, you go to the table, 8-4, and you see level of service D, and then you see level train, and then 40% no passing. So you get the V over C ratio equal to 0.6. All right, most of you did this problem correctly, okay? Any question how we get that? You go back to your book on table 8-4. All you need to know is whether it's a level train or a rolling train. So in this case, level train or level of service is D, okay? And then you have to have a 40% no passing. So you read that number, 0.6. Then you wanna find what your F sub D is. Your F sub D 
If you go to table 8-5, all you need to know is what is the split, 70-30, and you read the F sub D equal to 0.89. And then F sub W, you go to the table 8-6. Okay, and all you need to know is what's the length, what's the uh, shoulder width and what's the lane width. So 11 foot lane width, four feet shoulder and level of service D. So when you do that, you get the answer, which is 0 0.85. Any question how you got those numbers? So the only thing that's left is F sub HV. So let me put it here. So we need to get to F sub HV. So your F sub HV is one plus percentages of truck time one minus passage equivalent of truck plus percentage of RV times one minus passenger equivalent of RVs plus passenger percentage of the buses times one minus passenger car equivalent of the bus. So we got to get the passenger car equivalent of truck, RV, and EB. So for the Hello? Um, the, the bottom one, you wrote it backwards. It's supposed to be ET minus one, and then ERV minus one. That's how they have it in the book. What is it? I'm sorry. Oh, oh yeah, you are right. You are right. Yeah. ET minus one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, ET minus one. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. I just didn't look at anything. I was just look at my memory. ET minus one. Yeah. All right, now, where do we get the ET? You go to the table and then find, that's it, table 8-7. So you go ET equal to two. So the same table give you ERV equal to 1.6. And then E of buses is going to be 1.6. So you read that those numbers from the table 8-7. So all you need to put that into this formula. So that will be one divided by one plus 15% truck. So two minus one plus um 2% of rv so it's 0 0.02 professor didn't you ask for rolling not level no it's just a level train okay yeah the problem say level train here all right so e sub rv minus 1 is 1 1.6 minus 1 plus the bus is 5% so 0 0.05 1.6 minus one. So when you do that calculation, you end up with 0 
or 0.84 rounded up. So all you do is just put them into that formula here. Okay. So we put the 0.6. So you put the 0.6 here. F sub D, you put 0.89 here. F sub W, you put 0.85 here. And HV, you put 0.839 over here. And you multiply them, you calculate them, and you end up rounding it up at 1067. So that will be your service flow at level of service D. And that was 15 points. <coughs> Any question on that? Okay, so this was your exam. So your exam was pretty easy because all you had to do is, uh, yes, that's true. Um, so pretty much you had to know where each of those items are, which page and so on, just copy it if you didn't. If you read your book or you got familiar with the topics and so on, it wouldn't be a, a hard exam, okay? But obviously your um, next quiz or your final exam will be different than this, okay? So it will be more problems oriented as we go on. Okay, any question? Okay, so that was your exam. Um, now, we gotta go back to our lectures. Any question before I go to the lecture? Okay, that's great. All right, so what we're gonna do is that we finish the trip generation. You remember we were talking about land use models. We talk about population and uh, model. We talk about economic model, land use model. And then we talk about trip generation model. If you remember, we had three methods on trip generation. We had uh, cross classification model, which one was the handout that I gave you or uh, the, uh, the table that I use, which we found the trip rate and multiplied that trip rate by forecasted numbers of households and find the total trips generated. Then we use the ITE trip generation manual. Oh, before we do that, uh, then we did the graphical method that's in your book which was developed by Federal Highway Administration. So we did that. And then the third one, I mean, the second one, actually those both of them were cross classification model. So the second one was the uh, IT trip generation ma manual, which actually ITE, which is the Institute of Transportation engineers develop a bunch of books and manuscript workshops and so on. And uh, one of them that's very useful is called Trip Generation Manual. So if you open Trip Generation Manual, you can get the trip rate for any type of a development. So all you have to do is just multiply those rate by your size of the development. For instance, if you have a office space and um restaurants and so on if you get the square footage you just multiply those by trip generation rates and you can get those trip generation that's generated by those activities and the third one was the uh, regression model which we went over that extensively and i show you an example of it 
So these were the three methods that we used or trip generation. So now that we know how many trips is generated in, in, in any development, let's say 1000 trips is generated here. Now I like to know where are these trips coming from? And uh, what happened here is when we have an urban area, the whole area is divided into zones. And the size of those zones depends on where, where is the location. For instance, if you have area of downtown, these zones are very small because too many activities going on. So maybe it's 0.1 mile by 0.1 mile, the size of these zones. But if you go out of town because there's not much activity, these zones could be like one mile by one mile. So all depends on how much activity you have. So those are the size of these zones. All these zones, so the whole area, for instance, of Los Angeles County, anywhere is divided into zone and these zones are numbered. For instance, this is zone number one, this is zone number two, number three, and so on. So we have all of them numbered. Now on trip distribution, what we like to know is if you are in Cal State LA, for instance, zone number, let's say 10, I like to know where are the trips coming from any of these zones to Cal State LA. So each of you live in one of these zones. Not all of you live in one zone. So maybe somebody live in zone one. So this guy traveled to zone 10. This guy traveled from zone two, 10, three to 10 and so on. So from all these zones, everyone traveled to come to Cal State LA. So I like to know how many people coming from each of these zones to Cal State LA, which is you guys. For instance, if I have a class at university, like 3,700, each of you will come from different area and different zones to the class. So I like to know if I get the percentages, I like to know maybe 40% coming from North, okay, 30% coming from East, and another 20% coming from West, oh, 10% coming from South, that give me the trip distribution. If I have a zone to zone, then I can get the trip distribution from each zone to other zones. So 1,000 trips that we did the generation, then we have to know where are these trips going, okay, which is outbound, and then where are these trips coming from, which is the inbound. So this call, if I give you percentages of this, this give me the trip distribution. So the, the purpose of the tri trip distribution is allocation of the trips among different zones. That's the purpose of it. So the purpose is allocation of trips between zones. Usually <coughs> on trip distribution, when we have the zones, let's say we have zone to zone, so I have zone, let's say I have four zones, one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four. If I have four zones only, I like to know how many go from one to one inside, how many go one to two from zone one go to zone two, how many go from zone one to zone three, and how many go from zone one to four, and then from two, it goes to one, two to two, two to three, so I will have a table which give these numbers, give me the trip generate, trip distribution. How many trips go from each zone to other zones? So that's the purpose of the trip distribution. Everyone get that? Any question on the trip distribution? All right. Now there are different methods of figuring it out, okay? I show you one method that most of the consultant engineers use it, 
and you never study this in the in the classrooms or it's not in your book but i can say 70 80 percent of the consultant engineering transportation agencies are using that type of a system because when you're writing a traffic impact report you're writing it for one small development and you need to know what is the trip generation and what is the trip distribution you need to know mode split and assignment and then mitigation measures so those are the steps that you have to write in your travel impact report or traffic impact report now what the consultant engineers does usually especially in older days and now pretty much the same thing they don't sit down and to model all of these because it takes a long time and you need a lot of data and so on so they do it in different ways so i just tell you a few projects that i did which i use trip distribution one of the projects that i did long time ago in 80s was that I work on the downtown Long Beach. So downtown Long Beach was such as this, a quarter line. Okay, there were streets, downtown Long Beach, major streets. So each of these developers tried to develop a building. For instance, if you go downtown Long Beach, you can see all those high rise buildings. At the time that I was doing the study, there was pretty much none. So it was pretty empty. Now you go downtown Long Beach is totally different. So all those high rise buildings that you see, they propose each of them, they had to write a traffic impact report and show that if they build, for instance, the Arco building in downtown Long Beach, what would that building do to the traffic on the streets of the downtown? Is it gonna cause congestion or is not? Because if it causes congestion, they have to come up with a solution before they get a permit to build. So that's the purpose of the traffic impact report. Before you get a, re a permit to build, you have to analyze it and write a report we call a traffic impact report. And that traffic impact report has to be approved by city engineers and then it has to go to the planning commission in order to get a permit for your building. So each of these buildings, there were like nine, 10 of them at that time, I remember, proposed to build on those lands. And each of them wrote a traffic impact report. And show on that traffic impact report that by building those high rises, nothing significant happened to the traffic of the downtown Long Beach. Yes, it adds some traffic, but it's not to a point that could create severe congestion. So each of them wrote a traffic impact report and submitted to get the permit. Now the downtown Long Beach, the city engineers decided that maybe they should hire a independent consultant that that consultant put all of these buildings together and do a study and find out if you build all these buildings like nine of them at that time then what will happen to the downtown Long Beach how much traffic congestion we're going to have so that was the contract that I worked on so they gave me all these developments, each of them, the square footage and so on. And I had to analyze to see what happened. Okay, the trip generation part was easy because I had the information about each building, how many square footage of office space it is, how many square footage of retail they have, if there was an apartment, how many square footage of the apartment building, shops and all those i had all that information so for each building i went to the trip generation manual by ite <coughs> on 
I found out that, okay, what is the trip rate, for instance, for the office space? And it was, let's say, for instance, was during the peak hour was like four. I multiply by square footage, I got the trip generation. So I got the trip generation for each of these buildings from the trip generation manual. So I did it on a spreadsheet at that time. So it was not that difficult task, uh, just a lot of calculation. So that was the trip generation. Now the, the next question was, where are these trips come to each of those buildings? I need to know the direction. Okay, for that, yeah, you could do modeling, but that will take time, especially like back in 80s, we didn't have this type of uh, powerful computers to do the work. So it was very difficult to do modeling and use computer. So what I did is I said, all right, that, that's what the consultant engineer does mostly. I put a traffic counter on each of these major streets. And then I counted the number of cars that going in and out in each of them in the morning and in the afternoon. So morning was seven to 8 a.m. Afternoon was five to 6 p.m., which is the peak hour. So I did that for each of these. So, <clears throat> so then what I did is I added all the inbound. So I had this and I added all the inbounds from all sections and got the percentages. So for instance, 5% from that side, 10% from this side, 20% from this side, 5% from this side, and so on. So the total is 100%. So that means this is the way the traffic is coming toward by doing the counting on each of those stations. So I found the percentages of the trip that comes from each direction. So that was the inbound. And I did the same thing for outbound. So then I used that as a trip distribution. So for instance, if I wanted to look at this building here, and if there's a hundred people coming out of that building in the afternoon, knowing what is the outbound, <clears throat> I could say that if 10% going this way, I said, okay, 10% this way. 10% of 100 is 10, 10 people going this way. Okay, if there's a 20% this way, 20% that way and so on. So I use that as a trip distribution. Then later on, we have to get mode split that what mode of transportation they use, what percentage of automobile, what percentage of the buses and so on. And then we have to assign those trips over the network, which we call assignment model, which we will go over that. And then evaluate the capacity and see if that causes congestion or not. So that was a project actually. I worked on it for about six months. So that's how I got the trip distribution. Now, on a smaller project that I did, for instance, one project that I did was in city of Santa Monica. I was doing consulting in old days a lot, but mostly I was doing a lot of traffic impact report because once you do one or two of them, it gets pretty easy. So this guy, actually this is the Santa Monica Ocean Park Boulevard. And then there is a 29th and 30th street here. And there was a land available here that this architect called me up and said that we want to build a shopping center there. And that was around 50,000 square feet of shopping center. 
and the city of Santa Monica asked for the traffic impact report. So he contacted me and said, uh, can you write us this traffic impact report? And I mentioned that, yes, definitely. But he said, our time is limited. So he was calling me on Tuesday and wanted the traffic impact report but next Monday. And that was pretty difficult to do because it was the Thanksgiving weekend, I remember. So I could not collect data because usually we collect data on two days. One is two, Tuesday. If we collect them on Tuesday, we collect them on Wednesday. Or if we collect them Wednesday, we collect them on Thursday. So two days of the week, Thursday, Wednesday or Tuesday, Wednesday are good days for collecting data because Monday usually are not good and Friday is not good. So I told them I cannot do it because of these, I have to collect the, the trip generation again was easy because he gave me all the floor plan, how many square foot of uh, shopping, office spaces, restaurant and everything. So that was no problem. I go to trip generation manual, multiply the number, get the trip generation of that shopping center. But the question was, where are these trips coming from to go to that shopping center? For that, I needed to collect the data to see what percentage of the traffic going this way and what percentage going the other way and what percentage going in this section here and what percentage going here so that I can use those percentages and allocate my trip generation total to those directions. I told him that I cannot do it. And I remember that he said, well, if you are willing to give us the report by Monday, I double your fees. Then I said, okay, now you're talking. So I would do my best. So what I did, that's the first thing you have to do. You have to go to the tra uh, city engineer. So I went to the city engineer of Santa Monica and I told him that and usually what you do is you just draw this plan. When you go there, be prepared for it. I asked them that I know how to, to do the trip generation and I have to do this by next Monday. Is it possible for you to give me the percentage of the traffic that goes in each of, of these directions? Usually city engineer doesn't want to do that. The reason is this, because the data that we collect, he used those data to update his information. So they want that data. So I told them that I cannot do that because of the time limitation. So can you give me these directions? And he said, no, no. I said, okay, then. I remember that there was a development right on here, which was called Sports Connection. That was a gym that they build them and they did collect the data. And uh, in transportation traffic that we are doing, any data that's collect collected less than six months, you can use those data. So I told them that these are public information. You know, all the traffic impact report, you can go to the city, get a copy of it, no problem. Any development that you see is going up, you can always go and Say, I want, to, I want to see the traffic impact report of that. They give it to you. Maybe they charge you a fee of Xerox or whatever it is on those old days, but now it's pretty much they can email it to you. You can get that. So those are public information. And I said, okay, if you don't give me, I will go to that uh, traffic impact report and I will figure it out. What are the percentages? So anyway, after, you know, a discussion that I had with him, I was pretty much friendly with him. So he said, all right, I will do that. So he told me, for instance, 40% going this direction, 60% going this direction, and then here 5% going that direction, 5% going. So he gave me all those directions, <coughs> the percentages. So one thing that I learned in the consulting is I don't trust anyone. 
So when he gave me that, I had the plan right there, like what I'm showing you here. And I put those percentages on and I said, is this correct? All these percentages you gave me? He said, yes. I said, can we sign both of us here that this is what you said and this is what I agree with? He said, no problem. So you get that signature and you submit that in your appendix, in your report, because I had experience before that I talked to the city engineer and they gave me something. And when I did all the analysis, they came back to me and said, no, no, I didn't say that 40%, I said 30%. And then you had to do the analysis all over again. So that's what I learned that every time we talk and then he mentioned something and so on, I get a documentation that I can use them in case there is a problem. So in my report, I write that my trip distribution was discussed with the city engineer at Santa Monica on this date at this time. And we agreed that this is the trip distribution for this development as shown in the appendix. So then there will not be any question. So anyway, so that will be the trip distribution. As you see that I didn't do all that sophisticated counting and percentage and so on. So by just talking to him, because he knows pretty well, most of the city engineer know all the direction because they have all the data over there all the time. So they know the percentages pretty much. So that is another small project that I had to complete and then go to the planning commission and then, you know, and do the calculation, which is actually, that's a long procedure. And I did the same thing. I did the whole traffic impact report for Valencia. You know, that the city of Valencia, there were 3000 homes that were developed. And I had to do traffic impact report this highway five and there were a bunch of highway. That was a much bigger project. I did that traffic impact report by Magic Mountain. And I, as a matter of fact, I brought that to school and a lot of students I hired and they helped me out to do that project. So that would be the trip distribution. We call it manual method. So this is what we call manual method. And you don't have it in any book, but you learn it as you work for a transportation consultant. That's how they do it a lot. Okay, any question on that? Okay, but the next thing we do is, so on the trip distribution, one is we learn <coughs> how to do manual. Two, we're gonna talk about gravity model. Okay, the gravity model is a mathematical model based on Newtonian law of gravity. If you remember Newtonian law of gravity, that say force is equal to some constant times M1 times M2 divided by some distance squared. You remember that in the physics? So M1 was the mass one, mass two. So if you have two masses, M1 and M2, there's a force between that, which is a equal to some constant times M1, mass of M1 times mass of M2 divided by D squared. So we use that in transportation Instead of a mass one and mass two, we call that zone of production zone. And this is the attraction zone. So this is where you, for instance, your residential area is, where it produces the trip. For instance, this could be M2 would be the Cal State LA, which attracts the trip. So we said the number of the trips that go from zone I to zone J is equal to not mass one, mass two, it depends on how many trips generated in zone one and how many trips it attracted zone two and then divided by the distance squared. 
So we convert that into a transportation formula. So we write here T I J, where the T I J is the number of trips between zone I and J. So that's what we want to know. How many trips go from zone I to zone J, from zone one to zone two, for instance. Delta, as I said, is a constant. And instead of M1, we put the P1, or actually OI. OI is the number of the trips generated in zone I. And then AJ is the number of trips attracted to zone J. And then we have a constant B that's a constant. So we convert that formula into a transportation formula. So we write Tij, number of trips between zone I and J is equal to OI, AJ, okay, times delta over Cij to the power of B, okay? And then what is the Cij? Is distance time or cost between I and J. Okay, so this is the formula, pretty much is the same formula as that one. Your delta is the same, M1 is the number of trips generated here, or we call OI, and then M2 is number of trips attracted, and then distance could be CIJ, it could be the distance, or it could be travel time from this zone to the other zone, or it could be the cost from one zone to another zone. All right. Now, what we're gonna do is, What we're gonna do is that we're gonna make assumption. The assumption is that if I have a zone, a number of the trips is OI. For instance, let's say you are at home or you are actually at school. So your class produces the trip that you're gonna leave this class. So the number of people who are leaving total from the class will be equal to OI, correct? Because if there are 30 students in the class, each of you go to different directions. So if I add those, that will be equal to 30. So this is a trip that leaves. So we call that TI, you go to zone number one. You go TI, you go to zone number two. You go TI, you go to zone number three. You go TI, you go to zone number four. So each of you go to the different zone. So what I can say is that the summation of the TIJ, J from one to N, depends on how many zones it is. Here there are only four zones. Is equal to OI, correct? Because the number that leaves, the total of them should be equal to number that are in the class. Okay, 
Now, if I put the summation of this here, I from one to n, I can put the summation over here also, I from one to n, it doesn't make any difference. You know, on the summation, actually this is J from one to n. Okay, on the summation, anything that doesn't have a J comes out. So that will be delta that doesn't have a J, OI doesn't have a J. So that will be times whatever that has a J stays in the um, summation. So sigma Tij equal to delta OI times summation of Aj over Cij, J from one to N. Okay, but what is the, the summation of Tij equal to? We have it equal to OI, correct? So this is gonna be equal to OI. So from here, I can find what my delta is. OI divided by OI will be equal to one, correct? So it will be one divided by summation of AJ divided by CIJ to the power of B, J from one to N. So that will be my delta. Now I have to put that delta in my original formula. So my Tij that I had in the beginning before I put the summation on, I put my delta. So that will be OI, Aj divided by Cij to the power of B over the summation of Aj over Cij to the power of B, J from one to N. This is called gravity model. So this is the called gravity model. Now I will tell you what the B will be. B will have different number, depends on the purpose of the trip. For instance, if I have a purpose and the B, if it's a work, if you are going to work, your B is going to be 0.5. If you go shopping, B equal to two. If you are social, visiting friends, P equal to three and so on. They have got those B on the research studies so they determine what's supposed to be. So we use those numbers when we are doing, depends on the purpose of the trip. Your CIJ will be a distance from I to J, which we know what it is, or travel time, or cost, and number of the trips that originate in zone I, which is your production, AJ will be your attraction. So if you put all that, you can figure out how many trips go from one zone to another zone. And next time, I will give you an example of how we apply this model into four zones. Any question? So gravity model is one of the model that is a kind of an old model, but still a lot of places that are just using gravity model. And that's just the bread and butter of the planning. So you have to know what the gravity model is. Sometimes you go for an interview to get a job. And if it is related to the planning and the guy said, do you know what the gravity model is? So you should know what it is and tell them that. I have seen many times that they ask that question because that's an older model. A lot of places are using it and there are computer packages pretty much that's being used to do that. And we'll show you that later on. Any question? 
All right, so I see you guys next time and we'll give you that example next time.